Hey YouTube, how you doing? Thanks for stopping by. This is Matthew's Counselors Guild. Um, oops, oops, dropping the head there. Um, today we'll be doing a book review of The Grieving Brain by Mary Frances O'Connor, PhD. Uh, I decided to learn uh, read this book because uh, I needed some CEs. <laughs> Uh, and uh, the, the course uh, was 14, so I was like, that's a good deal, right? And I decided to pick it up, and I'm glad I did. Um, it is something that, uh, with my population, is very relevant and uh, very important to learn. Uh, I've, I've learned a lot, actually, and uh, I, I would recommend it. If you, if you work with that population, maybe the later adulthood population, and you're, or maybe um, um, something to do with... with uh, chronic disease population or something like that uh, it is really good I really liked it and uh, let's uh, let's look at it first up the author Mary Frances O'Connor associate professor of University in Arizona PhD in clinical psych postdoctoral fellowship in psycho neuro immunology okay um, and she had the quote here from the beginning of the book it says my contribution as a scientist has been to study grief from the brain's perspective from the perspective that the brain is trying to solve a problem when faced with the absence of the most important person in our life. Uh, I, I think in the book I remember reading that she said that our brain primary task is to solve problems. So how does it solve the problem of grief? And I think that's what she does with her book. She tries to show what the brain is doing throughout the, uh, the process of, of going through grief, how it's solving problems. And the beginning of the book uh, is what we'll look at first, uh, the brain's perspective. It's very, I guess, organic. Um, she talks a lot about the brain structures. She talks a lot about, and I'm not going to get into it, but the different hormones and the different you know, attachment. Um, so the hormones, the cells, the ears of the brain that's related to um, forming connections with people, but also what where grief tends to be at uh, within the brain. Um, not going to get that far into it, but it's really good. I'd recommend reading the book uh, if you'd like to learn more about uh, the brain structure that's related, uh, related to grief. Uh, first up, she says here, Grieving necessitates learning to live in a world with the absence of someone you love deeply, who is ingrained in your understanding of the world. Okay. Uh, so they go into virtual maps, and that's kind of, sorry, uh, the brain forms a virtual map and I think that kind of makes sense you know I bet you if you could close your eyes and figure out how to get out the front door of your house you could probably figure that out right well how do you do that you know how does your brain know um, now they say they have they have these object trace cells expectations built from experience okay so you kind of expect how many how many steps it would take you expect the certain obstacles that you probably walked by, you know, multiple times a day. Um, so you have these object trace cells. You also expect people, right? When uh, when you come home from work, you know who's who, who will be home. Um, maybe they'll be in the kitchen, maybe they'll be in the living room or in the bedroom, but you kind of have an idea just to experience of where that person is going to be. Uh, when you go out to the garage every morning, I'm sure you expect your car to be here be there right uh, when you call your wife you expect her to pick up you know uh, it's just all built in through experience and um, that's what the object trace cells are for and now they have place cells and those are cells where uh, where we are in the world and where other things are okay um, well, they're place cells so what happens when somebody no longer um, is in our world you know, um, the structure in the brain's still there, that cell's still there, but the person's not. You know, those expectations, the object trace cells of everyday living, having the same experiences, you know, they're still there. So you have to have to understand that when, when somebody dies, you know, when our wife dies or somebody that we, our husband dies, you know, it, they're not there, right? But our brain is still wired that they're here and that they they're still on our map they haven't been updated you know I, I put Tom Tom up there by virtual map um, now Tom Tom was kind of like Google Maps back in the early 2000s right 
and it was a device you had to buy, and it didn't update automatically. You know, you guys are people are really um, uh, fortunate for Google Maps because I mean they they update like at the minute almost because I know they would give me construction or a car accident coming up or traffic coming up. Where TomTom, Tom, you had to actually plug in the computer, pay, and then they update the 2023 20, map onto the device. So you're all updated. Um, and that's kind of what you have to do, to update it. And, and we'll get into that later. Um, but it, it shows why it's so hard to get bot, you know, past this. You know, we have these object trace cells. We have these place cells. And for some people, and I'll give you an example, it has a hard time giving that up to move on. Um, accept it, you know. Um, for example, uh, Mary, uh, she says here, uh, searching for your, our loved ones. And this is in a book. I just I thought it was a good example. Searching for our loved ones after they have died is a very common experience. Holding and smelling their things in order to feel close to them is also very common and does not mean the person is crazy. Okay. If years after the death of your daughter... You've kept her bedroom exactly the way it was the day she died can be problematic. And she says here, in the first case, you are in the present and remembering the past with all the pain and sadness and bittersweetness of having known and loved uh, that person. In the second case, you're trying to live in the past, pretending the time has stopped, not letting yourself have new experiences, develop new place cells and new object tra trace cells. And uh, they, they go into, like, prolonged grief disorder and things that could, you know, happen uh, for that person. But really, and the, this we'll talk about this later, is really moving on, getting new experiences, acceptance is really important. Um, now, here's some theories that were in the book. I thought they were pretty good. Construal Level Theory by Yaakov Trope and Nira Lieberman, Tel Aviv University. And they say... Um, uh, people are not currently present in one's immediate reality. They could be gone for a few different reasons. Abstract ideas are construals of where they are or might be by making predictions, using memories and speculations to imagine the person. So I don't know where my, my dog is, right? But I have a good idea where he might be. Um, maybe my car. Um, my... My, maybe my brother, well, he lives in a different state, so I don't know where he is. I can kind of guess, you know, but it would be a very broad guess where I think with my own immediate family, you know, I would know more exactly where they're at. Um, so I do have construals for, for family. Um, if I was to guess where my boss was, you know, that would be a really bad guess because, of, you know, I'm not close. I don't really follow them that much. Um, so here, now, and close are really important. The people that are here, now, and close are what you form the, I think, just a more broader construal with, you know, um, where it's not so general with, with acquaintances or um, people that you don't experience here, now, and close a lot with. Uh, through attachment, this is how we keep track of our loved ones. When someone dies, our brains can com sorry, can't compute this reality at first because it's outside the brain's experience. We need new experiences to update. Now that's construal level theory. If you want to Google that and, and read more about it, it's really interesting. Uh, I, I kind of like it. It kind of goes with the whole trace and object cells, um, what we were talking about earlier. And next up, we have the dual process mode of bereavement. She talks about this in the book. And the key to coping well after you lose someone is flexibility. This is uh, Mary... Uh, saying this, attending to what is happening day to day and also being able to focus on coping with whichever stressor has currently reared its ugly head. Bereaved people also have times when they are not consumed by grief, when they are simply engaged in everyday experiences outside the two ovals. An oval is another diagram they showed. Um, I, I put the other one up. I, I like the one I have, the, the little display there. As time passes, they are more and more engaged in everyday life and the difficulties of loss and of storing a meaningful life recede gradually. The ovals represent loss, disruption, and striving to, for restoration. 
never disappear, but these stressors evoke less intense and less frequent emotional reaction. Now you see the oscillating. You go back and forth, you know, when you're grieving. You go back and forth. You're not just stuck on loss. And I think maybe the people that were, you know, keeping the daughter's bedroom all the same, um, they weren't doing any of the restoration, maybe. You know, they were just kind of stuck. They wanted to just um, deny, avoid any kind of restoration and, and you know, accept, um, move on. Um, but you kind of go back and forth, and that's, and that's what you want to be, you know. It's... It's not all good, but it's not all bad. You, you want to go back and forth um, in order to go, get through it. Changing life of older couples. And she went over this study, and I thought it was interesting. It was back in 2001, done at University of Michigan. It was a longitudinal study of 1,500 older adults with hundreds of questions across different time points before and after the death of the spouse. I think I remember it was in the book. It was the only one done like this. It was huge. Um, and they found out, and I found this was really interesting, uh, four trajectories that people could use to categorize people's grieving. First up is resilient. These, those who never developed depression after the death of a loved one. And that's the most common. Okay. But also you have the chronic grieving. Depression that begins after the death of a loved one and is prolonged. Okay. They're not oscillating. You know, they're not. They're not accepting. They're not. They're, they're stuck. They're the people that are um, keeping their bedroom the same, or you know, no longer sleeping in the bed, the same bed they shared with their spouse, or something like that. Um, the chronic grievers. Then you got chronic depression, depression that begins before death of a loved one and continues to worsen after death. And then you got depressed and pruned, pre-existing depression that abates after the death of a loved one. Now I wonder if they they were depressed and then maybe they're caring for um, their, their, their you know chronically ill husband or, or mother or something like that and they were really depressed about it and then they passed and they felt like maybe some relief um, that's what I'm guessing what that one is they didn't really talk much about that in the book but they went over the other three uh, pretty good um, okay but that's the interesting study uh, I, I didn't never heard of that one so uh, next up, therapies. They went over a lot of therapies, complicated grief treatment, which is uh, um, by Kathy Shear. And Shear says that uh, with, with CGT, they revisit intense and overwhelming emotions again and again and teaching skills to move flexibly in and out of these feelings. Uh, you'll be finding goals and activities with a therapist that elicit small amounts of interest uh, is a rev revelation strengthening social connections, finding and improving relationships with kind or loving people who will be in their life afterwards. Therapist guided imagined conversation with the deceased. Um, well, they have CGT. I think she talked about CBT too. Um, I can't think of any others. But uh, some of the things that she says uh, was very ACT, right? You know, acceptance commitment therapy. Uh, but we'll look at that later. Flexibility. So Mary, Dr. O O'Toole, is it O'Toole O'Connor? O'Connor. I want to keep saying O'Toole. Dr. O'Connor says flexibility. The frequency and intensity of people's feelings typically increase after a loss. And uh, she talks about the importance of being flexible. And I think that has to do with the oscillating, you know, going back and forth. You kind of have to be flexible. Confronting one's emotions and understanding and understanding them has been considered a good coping strategy. The most reliable predictor of good mental health is having a large toolkit of strategies to deal with one's emotions and deploying the right strategy at the right time. Flexibility in our approach and openness to dealing with feelings as they arise give us the best opportunity to regulate our emotions in a way that allows us to live a vibrant and meaningful life. So flexibility is really important, not just with grief, but with a lot of stress, a lot of different life stressors. The key is flexibility. And uh, the last line in bold, I really like that says, the challenge for a grieving person is to accept the reality that their loved one has died. So acceptance is really important. Uh, I have a client who would probably put him under the chronic grieving. And, you know, he came and he, he did our program and 
uh, I think when he was able to accept, I mean, you, I mean, you could see an in, almost an instant change, you know, in him, almost a 360, you know, just accepting it, moving on, finding new experiences. I mean, he did all this, all this stuff, and he, he was much better. I and mean, we were able to to discharge him, and um, uh, I think he's going to be good. I think he is. I mean, he's really hurt uh, by the loss of his wife, but he really uh, worked on himself and and. He did this stuff. I mean, this is the things that he did. Um, okay. So there's some therapies there. Uh, she talks more about acceptance. And I want to put this here because I think acceptance is really important with grief. Accepting is knowing that the person is gone, that they will never return, that there is nothing to be done about things that happened in their lifetime. That regrets and goodbyes are part of the past. Okay. Accepting is focusing on life as it is now without the deceased, without forgetting the deceased, accepting a simple awareness of the reality with the hope that the reality of the present moment can be meaningful or hard, joyful or challenging. The key to accepting isn't doing anything that, with what you are experiencing, not asking what your feelings mean or how long they'll last. Accepting is not about pushing them away and saying that you can't bear it. It is not about believing that you are now a broken person. It is about noticing how you feel in the moment, letting your tears come, and then letting them go, knowing that the moment of grief will overwhelm you, feeling it familiar knot in your throat, and knowing that it will recede. Okay, kind of like it just reminds me of the whole worry trap with the ACT um, book, where they talk about the wave. You know how the wave comes in, and then it goes down, and then you know kind of rec you know recede or um um i guess i forgot the, what the word oh gosh uh, peaks and crest crest right um and it's kind of like that you kind of you know same thing with grief when it comes in just accept it let it happen you know just um stay in the present moment and just go with it and then eventually it'll come down and uh and she said that's that's really important and uh, it's very helpful for people that are dealing with grief and not to try to avoid that or try to stuff it in words and try, you know, but just let it come. Let it come. It's got to happen. You got to do it. It's part of moving on, you know, just let it come and let it let it go. Um, so I thought that was that was really interesting and, and, and good. Um, but acceptance, really important. She also talks about being in the present. What does the present have to offer, she says. Possibility. Although many aspects of what is happening now may be painful, there are also aspects in the present moment that, we are, that are wonderful. If you avoid painful feelings by avoiding the awareness of what's going on around you, what you end up with is being unaware of what's going on around you. Not just negative, but positive. And some people in grief, they, they have kind of a positive or negative um, a kind of a negative focus right you know they they don't they, they can't stand living without them it's lonely it's quiet um you know i hate making dinner for one you know that types of things but you know that's all thinking in, in the past and the, you gotta look at the present like what's good you know you're you're still alive you got kids um you got a dog um you know you still you still have this life what do you want to do with it Ignoring the present makes it difficult to learn what works in the new ways you are living your life. Okay, so if I'm gonna live in the present, uh, I'm gonna, you know, what am I gonna do with this time? You know, I'm gonna go and meet new people. I'm gonna go out. You know, it's going kind of going back to that dual process model of bereavement, where if you look at the restoration oriented, you know, all that um, can happen more in the present, right? More in the present, more in the future. Um, New roles, identity, relationships. Um, you know, you lost your spouse of 40 years. Um, I mean, you, you can get through that. Maybe you can start a, you know, a group, find find some friends, you know, find something. But you can do it now, you know, and in the future, I guess. But mainly in the present uh, is where you want to kind of look at what you're doing now and not be so focused on the past and the future you have a better chance of reaching your goal if you have many ways you might consider your life meaningful 
And she says here, it requires your brain to learn new things, right? aided by paying attention to what you actually find meaningful and satisfying in the present moment. Grieving is the change of, from having your attachment needs fulfilled by your deceased loved one to having them consistently fulfilled in other ways. Restorated, orient, restoration oriented. To restore a meaningful life, we have to be able to imagine that life. Um, okay, so future is really important. Present is really important. The past is important, but I, you don't want to get hung up there. I think you want to focus on what can I do today? You know, what do I want to be tomorrow? You know, I want to sit here on my couch wearing the same shirt. You know, it's like, um, I think you're not, you're not focused on what can you do now? Well, maybe I can get up, take a shower, go out, go to the gym, go on a walk, you know, and, and do those small little things every day, you know, and, and really get through the grieving process. You can only get through it if you allow it. If you st stay in the past and you get hung up on, you know, your lost uh, loved one, then you're going to become depressed. You're going to have prolonged grief disorder. You're not going to be able to move on. You're not going to be able to f have new experiences and form new connections and build new trace cells and new object trace cells. What's the other one? Place cells. So you want to you want to make sure you're having those experiences so your brain can update its map. Okay, and doesn't mean you forget and you move on. You know, you can always have that person uh, memorial you know tomb if you had a tombstone or something you know in your house to memorialize them something like that to kind of keep them close to you but know that they're no longer here accept that and and just go out and and live you know the rest of the time you have with with people you know form new connections you don't have to go out and get married again or anything like that but just you know new friends um that type of thing so that was kind of all the end of the book that's why i, I like the structuring of it kind of goes from the organic what's going on in the brain and it gives you some theories and it gives you a lot of information about you know what we want to do uh, to get through grief so I thought it was really good I really liked it I'd recommend it if you are um, working that population it I don't think it's for like lay people I don't say lay people that sounds terrible but like um, I would say you'd want to be I would say you'd probably want um, at least to be in the field to, to, to really grab some of the concepts and theories. I think if you're if you're looking for a book to help you get through grief, it, it may be helpful, um, I, especially the last part where it kind of talks about acceptance, staying in the present, and look at the future. Uh, she also, uh, the author also went through a depth, and she kind of talks about that and what worked for her and. Um, so it might be helpful to read if you're just looking for something to help you. Uh, but really, if, if you're a therapist, psychiatrist that works with that population, I think you'd really enjoy it. You'd get something out of it. So, uh, But that's all I have. Uh, if you have any comments, please leave them. If you have any questions, um, you can put them in a comment. I'll answer them. Um, you can like and subscribe. I appreciate it. But that's all I got. Uh, again, go check out The Grieving Brain. The Grieving Brain? Brain? Uh, it's only like, I don't think it's that much money. It's only like 20 bucks, I think. And it's not that long. It took me about a week to read. If you do two chapters a week, um, it's only like 220 pages. So not that long at all. Uh, but it's, it's definitely worth getting. So check it out. And uh, that's where I'll stop it. You have a good night. Thank you.